thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This is the last episode in the series, The Politics of Murder, in which I detail cases of political violence. This week, extreme political conspiracy theories radicalize a former peace-loving man. First introduced to him by a former girlfriend, David DePape goes down a rabbit hole, consuming ever more radical views on YouTube, blogs, and social media posts. A perfect storm of factors will cause him to carry out a baffling and horrific attack after breaking into the home of the Speaker of the House of Representatives. This is Chapter 3 of The Politics of Murder, The Attack on Paul Pelosi. Pacific Heights, an upscale neighborhood in San Francisco with views of the Golden Gate Bridge and the San Francisco Bay, is one of the most expensive neighborhoods in the United States. Its stately Victorian mansions are home to the wealthy and powerful, including the Gettys, billionaire real estate developer Jay Paul, and Peter Thiel, co-founder of PayPal. The 3,300-square-foot home at the corner of Steiner and Broadway in Pacific Heights is recognizable as the house used in the 1993 feature film Mrs. Doubtfire, starring Robin Williams and Sally Field. On Friday, October 28, 2022, shortly after 2 a.m., a private security guard was on duty in Pacific Heights when he heard the sound of breaking glass. He was seated in his vehicle on a quiet street when the sound briefly broke the silence. He waited a few moments but did not know exactly which direction it had come from. Hearing nothing out of the ordinary afterward, he put it out of his mind. He might have given it a second thought since, just minutes earlier, he'd sighted the lone figure of a man walking nearby. He was dressed in dark clothing and wearing a backpack. Minutes later, the same man entered the back gate of one of the Pacific Heights mansions and crept silently towards the glass French doors at the rear of the house. He retrieved a hammer from his backpack, swung it at the glass, and shattered a portion just above the doorknob. He reached in, unlocked it, and entered the residence. Moments later, 82-year-old Paul Pelosi woke from a deep sleep in an upstairs bedroom of his three-story home. As he focused his eyes in the dark, he saw a man standing over his bed. He sat up with a start as the man spoke. Are you Paul Pelosi? the man asked. He was holding a hammer at his side. Pelosi answered, yes. The man then asked, where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? The man appeared calm, but determined. Paul Pelosi right away felt it was imperative to keep him that way. He explained that his wife, Nancy Pelosi, was away. She was in Washington, DC and wouldn't be home for a day. Nancy Pelosi, also 82, served as the Speaker of the House of Representatives for the Democratic Party twice, from 2007 to 2011, and again beginning in 2019. A member of Congress since 1987, Pelosi served California's 11th Congressional District, which included most of the city of San Francisco. After being informed that the Speaker would not be home for a while, the man answered, Okay, well then I'm going to tie you up. As the man began pulling zip ties out of his backpack, Paul Pelosi made a dash for the hallway. Just off the bedroom was an elevator, and Pelosi ran toward it. He was stopped by the intruder, who caught the door to keep it from closing. Pelosi, resigned now that he couldn't make an easy escape, walked back with the man to the bedroom and sat on the edge of the bed. He asked the intruder why he wanted to see his wife. Well, she's number two in line for the presidency, right? He answered. Pelosi said that that was true. The intruder began a rambling explanation of his grievances, saying that Washington politicians were, quote, all corrupt, and that we have to take them all out. As he spoke, Pelosi took stock of the man. He had sandy brown hair and a short scruffy beard, and was dressed in cargo shorts, tennis shoes, and a pullover fleece jacket. He was a big man, standing well over six feet tall, stocky, and solidly built. From his rambling speech and mannerisms, Pelosi immediately knew that he was not mentally balanced. He quickly ran through a list of possible options to get out of the alarming situation he found himself in. He decided to appeal to the man's humanity and asked if he could use the bathroom. The man allowed it 
and Pelosi entered the master bathroom. His cell phone was charging in a bathroom outlet, and he quickly grabbed it, hit the speakerphone button to open the line, and dialed 911. The call reached San Francisco Emergency Services at 2.23 a.m. San Francisco, please, 74. 2022. Oh, I guess I, I, guess I, I called my mistake. What is this? Seconds. This is San Francisco, please. Do you need help? Oh, well, there's a gentleman uh, here just waiting for my wife to come back. Nancy Pelosi. Uh, he's just uh, waiting for her to come back because she's not going to be here for a day, so I guess we'll have to wait. Zero, okay, two, do you need police, three, fire, or medical for anything? Eight seconds. Uh, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Zero, two, twenty-three, and fifty-eight okay. seconds. Yeah, uh, there's the, the uh, um, is the Capitol Police around? Zero, two, twenty. No, this they, is they usually zero, take my wife. They're usually seconds. here. They're usually here at the house protecting my wife. Uh, no, this, this is San Francisco Police. Friday, October. I, I, no, I understand. Eight, two thousand twenty-two. Um, okay, well. Zero, uh, twenty-four, and I know, what do you seconds. Uh, he thinks everything's good. Uh, I, I've got a problem, but he thinks everything's good. Zero, uh, okay. Call us back if you change your mind. No, no, no. This this gentleman just uh, came into the house. Uh, and he wants to wait here for my wife to come home. Zero, two, and so, uh, four, and 48. Anyway, he's on the phone Do day. you know who the person is? No, I don't know who he is. He, he, uh, uh, he has Zero, his, two, he's telling me, he's, four, he's telling me not to, uh, he's telling me not to do anything. What is your address, sir? Uh, two, twenty, five, and zero. What is your name? Seconds. Uh, my name is Paul Pelosi. Friday, anyway, this, this gentleman says that uh, he thinks that we ought to, you know, he, he told me to put the phone down and uh, just do what he said. Okay? Okay, who, what's the gentleman's name? I don't know. What's that? My name's David. Da the name is David. Okay, and who is David? I, I don't know. I, what's that? I'm a friend of theirs. Yeah, I, I, um, he says he's a friend, but... As but, I say, you don't, I've never but you don't know who he is? And no, no ma'am. Eight seconds. Okay. He's telling me I'm being very leading, so I, I got to stop Zero, talking to you, okay? Two, twenty-five, and okay. You sure I can stay on the phone with you just to make sure everything's okay? No, he wants he wants me to get that off the phone. Zero two twenty. Okay. Six, okay. And zero eight. Thank you. Seconds. Okay. Bye. Pelosi appears to be using subtle and coded language to make the operator understand that he was in a dangerous situation without angering the hammer-wielding man. Surprisingly, the intruder gave the 911 operator his name. My name is David, he said. David DePape, 42, was born in Canada and raised in Powell River, British Columbia. He grew up with his twin sister, Joanne, his mother, and stepfather, Jean. Family and friends remember him as a good kid who wanted to leave his small town life and travel. Others said he was sweet and shy and easily influenced by others. He tried to fit in and for whatever reason, did not form a solid sense of identity, but seemed to gravitate towards others with strong personalities to gain security. After graduating from high school, he moved to Hawaii and then to California. He became acquainted with a San Francisco woman named Gypsy Taub. Gypsy, born Oksana Chernensky in Moscow, arrived in California at the age of 23 to study medicine at San Francisco City College, but dropped out after 18 months. Gypsy's nickname as a girl was Olesia, which means forest girl. So it's no wonder she felt welcome in the city by the bay San Francisco tends to attract free-spirited individuals with activist leanings and unique personalities. After leaving college, she made ends meet as an exotic dancer and nude model. She founded and ran an adult video website in the 1990s. Taub met DePape in 2000, when she was 42 and the mother of three, and he was 31. They had an on-again, off-again relationship, 
but remained close friends when they weren't romantically linked. They lived together, sometimes as lovers, sometimes as friends, and her children considered DePape a father figure. Between 2000 and 2009, Taub had children with two other men. Taub and DePape split up for about a year and a half. During that time, his mental health reportedly declined, and he began living on the street. He became increasingly paranoid, according to his ex-girlfriend. They reunited in 2010, and again, according to Taub, it was while they were apart that DePape began claiming he was the living embodiment of Jesus Christ. Taub began a campaign to promote public nudity in San Francisco. She protested a proposed city ordinance prohibiting people above the age of five from being nude in public. I'm a Bay Area native, and I don't believe this was a significant problem in the city. I'd be more inclined to believe that the law was enacted due to the large number of mentally ill people living on the streets, still an issue here, unfortunately, with whom, also unfortunately, it is not uncommon to see disrobing in public. But Taub took the issue personally and said it violated her freedom of expression. She led a movement to protest the ordinance. At a public hearing in 2012, Taub removed her clothes and was forcibly removed and detained by officers. The ban went into effect in 2013, and Taub filed a class action suit against the city of San Francisco. At this time, Taub was living in Berkeley with David DePape, her three children, and her 20-year-old fiancé, James Smith. That year, the 44-year-old wed Smith in a nudist wedding in front of San Francisco City Hall. Both the bride and groom were nude. DePape, who served as best man, was fully clothed. DePape continued living in Berkeley with the newlyweds, making and selling hemp jewelry, and helping to raise Tob's younger children. In 2015, he left Tob's home and ended the relationship for good. By this time, Tob says, DePape had, quote, completely lost his mind. Periodically, DePape was homeless and was a familiar face in Berkeley, California, often showing up at soup kitchens for a meal. He was considered a gentle giant, and there are no reports of him behaving violently. But behind the scenes, DePape grew angry and set on revenge. His ex-girlfriend introduced him to other things besides advocating for public nudity, such as belief in conspiracy theories and a mistrust of the government. Taub was a 9-11 denier, who believed that the attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon on September 11, 2001, was orchestrated by the U.S. government. She hosted a public access television show, Uncensored 911, to share these opinions. In 2008, she started another independently produced cable TV show called My Naked Truth to discuss her views on 9-11 and other conspiracy theories. She hosted both shows, you guessed it, naked. DePape, whose mental state from an early age can be described as fragile, fully embraced Tob's belief in these conspiracy theories. This led him down a rabbit hole of other such claims he found discussed in more radical forums online. Previous to this, DePape had supported President Barack Obama and aligned himself with progressive causes. By 2012, he began immersing himself in extreme political right-wing theories. DePape believed in the concept of a shadow government or that powerful people working behind the scenes held political power. He believed that these private individuals or organizations controlled publicly elected leaders who were subservient to them. DePape believed that politicians, including President Trump, were, quote, puppets of the shadow government. This conspiracy theory has been around for some time and has spread exponentially via the Internet. Groups said to make up this shadow government include central banks, communists, intelligence agencies, think tanks, Catholics, wealthy Jewish families and organizations, and even extraterrestrials, among others. The deep state conspiracy evolved from the belief in a shadow government and grabbed a firm foothold with a portion of the American public during the Trump administration. Trump political strategists alleged that deep state players were interfering with his administration and that the U.S. Department of Justice was complicit. It was also alleged that intelligence officers and executive branch officials were leaking information to undermine Trump's political agenda. In 2018, allegations would be made against FBI Director Robert Mueller as part of this deep state conspiracy. His agency was investigating Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. The deep state concept was central to the QAnon conspiracy theory, which DePape also believed in. 
The term QAnon became synonymous with a far-right conspiracy theory that began online by an anonymous figure known only as Q. Q alleged that a cabal of satanic cannibalistic child molesters were running a global sex trafficking ring out of Washington, D.C., and was conspiring against President Trump. Those who began following these claims by Q online became known collectively as QAnon members or supporters. QAnon members believed that Trump's administration was secretly fighting against this cabal of pedophiles and one day would arrest thousands of perpetrators and carry out mass executions. Those rumored to be dangerous predators included Democratic political figures like the Clintons and Obama, Hollywood actors, business tycoons, and high-ranking officials. DePape began filling his days searching out and consuming extreme right-wing conspiracy blogs, websites, and YouTube channels. He started a website of his own in which he shared his views with a non-existent audience. Besides sharing his belief in these and other conspiracy theories, DePape also expressed his hatred for, quote, the liberal media, stating that any journalist who wrote that these beliefs were false, quote, should be dragged out in the street and shot. DePape also went on racist, sexist, and anti-Semitic rants that he posted to his blog and wrote that the COVID pandemic was a hoax and that COVID-19 vaccines were part of a government conspiracy. DePape's mental health was in steep decline by this time. He was living in Richmond, California, working odd jobs to survive, and spending hours a day online reading and posting about government conspiracies. His illegal drug use increased, which led to ever more delusional thoughts and paranoia. DePape also believed in the false claims that the 2020 election was stolen. On January 6, 2021, when a group of armed Trump supporters who also believed in this claim attacked the Capitol, DePape rooted them on, believing that they were patriots fighting to bring down the shadow government. Clearly, his mind was far from rational, and his beliefs became contradictory as his thoughts became more unbalanced. While previously he labeled Trump as a puppet of the shadow government, he now stood on the side of those who were determined to keep him in power. Still, when the Capitol rioters chanted, Where's Nancy? as they stalked the halls of the U.S. Capitol building, seeking to hunt down Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, David DePape took it to heart, repeating the exact same words a year and a half later, when he broke into her home, wielding a hammer. At 2.27 a.m., San Francisco Emergency Services dispatcher Heather Grives ended her call with Paul Pelosi. Although he and the man she heard in the background said they didn't need assistance, she sent a police unit to the address Mr. Pelosi had provided. She logged it as a high-priority well-being check. Back at the Pelosi's three-story brick home on Broadway Street in Pacific Heights, David DePape told Pelosi he was tired from carrying the backpack to the residence and needed to sleep. He planned to wait for Nancy Pelosi to return home. Still wearing shorts and a striped pajama top, Pelosi was directed down the stairs by DePape, who followed behind him, still carrying the hammer and zip ties. Hoping to convince the intruder to leave, he told DePape that the police would arrive any minute. Becoming agitated, DePape raised the hammer and threatened Pelosi, saying, I can take you out. Instinctively, Pelosi reached up and grabbed the weapon's handle in an attempt to stop it from striking him. By now, they were near the front door. Just then, the doorbell rang. It was 2.31 a.m., four minutes after the dispatcher had sent a patrol unit to the residence. Upon hearing the doorbell, DePape ordered Pelosi not to answer it, but he did so anyway. San Francisco police officers Colby Wilms and Kyle Cagney stood on the porch. Pelosi greeted them nervously as they inquired if everything was okay. DePape, standing just behind Pelosi, answered, Everything's good. It was dark in the foyer, and one of the officers turned on his flashlight to get a better look inside. He saw the larger man holding the bottom of a hammer with one hand, while Pelosi gripped it towards the top of the handle. DePape held Pelosi's right arm with his other hand. Realizing that the large man had the hammer raised and that the older man was in imminent danger, the officer shouted, Drop the hammer! DePape, still calm, responded, Um, nope as he twisted the hammer out of Pelosi's hands. Pelosi lost his grip on the handle. DePape raised it and swung it down onto Pelosi's head. He fell instantly. Officers rushed in and tackled DePape, 
He was disarmed and handcuffed. Paul Pelosi lay unconscious on the floor as blood began pooling around his head. The entire attack on Paul Pelosi was recorded on the officer's body cameras. David DePape was taken into custody for the attack on Paul Pelosi. Before they reached the police station, he began talking. He confessed to the crime, his plans to cause harm to the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, and his motivation. Quote, I am sick of the insane effing level of lies coming out of Washington, D.C., DePape ranted. I came here to have a little chat with his wife. I didn't really want to hurt him. But, you know, this was a suicide mission. I'm not going to stand here and do nothing, even if it cost me my life. Hurting him was not my goal. I told him before I attacked him that he was escalating things, and I'll go through him if I have to, end quote. DePape said he planned to take Nancy Pelosi hostage and talk to her. She was, quote, the leader of the pack of lies told by the Democratic Party, he said. He said he would let her go if she told the truth and admitted the lies told to the American people. If she lied, he planned to break her kneecaps and wheel the injured speaker into Congress to, quote, show other members of Congress there were consequences to actions, end quote. Investigators also discovered that DePape had a GoPro camera to keep his hands free. He planned to video his attack on Nancy Pelosi and then post it online. He also admitted to having additional targets on his list, including a local college professor and prominent state and national politicians. A handwritten list was later found in which DePape had jotted the names of California Governor Gavin Newsom, actor Tom Hanks, and President Biden's son, Hunter Biden. After being asked why he didn't leave the residence, after the 911 call was placed, DePape said he wasn't concerned about getting caught because, quote, much like the American founding fathers with the British, he was fighting against tyranny without the option of surrender, end quote. More zip ties, duct tape, a rope, a second hammer, and gloves were found in DePape's backpack. David DePape was taken to the hospitals and treated for a dislocated shoulder, an injury he received when officers tackled him. He was then booked into San Francisco County Jail. Paul Pelosi regained consciousness about three minutes after the attack. He was rushed to the emergency room with a fractured skull and injuries to his arm and hands. He underwent surgery for a skull fracture and remained in the hospital for a week. Nancy Pelosi rushed home on a government flight to be by her husband's side while he recovered from the attack. She wrote a letter to members of the House of Representatives saying that she and her family were, quote, heartbroken and traumatized by the life-threatening attack. She thanked law enforcement, emergency services, and hospital staff for aiding her husband. A month later, Paul Pelosi made his first appearance since that awful night. He attended the Kennedy Center Honors event with his wife and wore a hat to hide his head injury. On October 31st, federal officers charged David DePape with attempted kidnapping of a federal official, assaulting an immediate member of a federal official's family, and inflicting serious injury with a dangerous weapon. A grand jury indicted him on November 9th. As a Canadian national, the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement filed an immigration detainer on DePape. After he is eventually released from prison in the U.S., he will be taken into custody by U.S. immigration and possibly deported. The state also filed criminal charges against DePape for attempted murder, residential burglary, elder abuse, and assault with a deadly weapon. If convicted on these charges, he will face an additional 13 years to life. DePape was denied bail. He pled not guilty to both the state and federal charges. DePape's federal trial began on November 9, 2023. With the attack caught on video, his attorney had no choice but to admit what he'd done, but said it only happened because his fragile mental state caused him to be easily convinced of radical conspiracy theories. Paul Pelosi testified at trial, stating that he was still recovering both physically and emotionally from the crime. DePape testified in his own defense, telling the court that his intended target was Nancy Pelosi, not her husband. He admitted to hitting Paul Pelosi with, quote, full force of the hammer, but described how he'd been radicalized since 2014 to believe in conspiracy theories. He said he'd immersed himself in culture war stuff online, 
had listened religiously to right-wing podcasts and subscribed to YouTube channels dedicated to extreme right-wing conspiracies. He shared an additional detail of his planned attack on Nancy Pelosi. He had planned to wear a unicorn costume while interrogating her and upload a video to social media. On November 16, 2023, David DePape was found guilty of two federal charges. In May 2024, he was sentenced to 30 years in prison, followed by five years of supervised release. During his state trial that same month, DePape's rambling and conspiracy-filled testimony from his federal trial was allowed in as evidence. On June 21st, he was found guilty of five state charges. He is currently awaiting his sentence on these charges, with the hearing set for October 29, 2024, almost exactly two years since the attack. Gypsy Taub was barred from attending DePape's state trial. The judge said she attempted to influence jury members after graffiti was found in the women's bathroom. It listed a website that DePape's family had set up proclaiming his innocence. Back in the spotlight, Taub made herself available to reporters as the trial proceeded. She was interviewed frequently and handed out slips of paper with a link to the website in support of DePape. Both DePape's family and his attorneys argued that, without his ex-girlfriend, he may have stayed a sweet, shy boy. His sister, Joanne Robinson, said DePape had, quote, gotten involved with a crazy person. His defense at the federal trial said that Taub, quote, heavily influenced his belief in conspiracy theories and inflicted immeasurable harm to his mental state, end quote. Taub divorced her 20-year-old husband, James Smith, after two years of marriage. In 2019, she was arrested and charged with attempted child abduction, stalking, and child abuse. She was accused of becoming involved with the 14-year-old son of a friend, whom she had sent numerous messages urging him to run away. His mother filed a restraining order when she discovered the relationship. In 2021, Taub was convicted on all three counts and sentenced to four years behind bars. She was paroled in April 2023. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime, and we'll wrap up the series, The Politics of Murder. You can listen to an extra episode of the series by becoming a Patreon member. Starting at just $5 a month, you can get bonus episodes and behind-the-scenes videos of the podcast. You'll also get all episodes before everyone else and without ads. I'll even throw in some special gifts by mail. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to find out more and join. True crime YouTuber Danny recently interviewed me on Danny After Dark. You can watch the video to hear our fun chat about serial killer profiling and learn more about me and my true crime obsession. Go to the YouTube channel Danny After Dark to check out that video. I've included a link in the show notes. I'd appreciate the views. And while you're there, if you really want to help, leave a comment. Thank you so much. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Sanchez Ludlow. My executive producer is Lorena Garcia, and my researcher is Emma Battaglia. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>